Okay, so we have a new visitor. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Ryan and did my undergrad here at Ottawa University. I uh, did accounting and business administration. I work for Farmers Insurance as an accountant and uh, I'm halfway done with my math. Oh, good. All seen Ryan before. You guys pretty much all making the rounds with each other. So that's yeah. mostly an introduction to me. But okay, um, so I want to start off today with hearing what you learned or didn't learn or need more information on. So I saw you guys got through some way somehow uh, through the homework. So did you have? questions on some of it, some things that didn't quite work for you, you didn't quite get it, you didn't get it at all. Uh, you guys hear me okay in Overland Park? Yeah, we can hear you okay. We couldn't hear what the other student was saying. Okay. Uh, yeah, he didn't say much, but yes, well, <laughs> I'll take that under advisement. If somebody asks me a question, I'll try to reiterate it. That's what we were trying to do with that other speaker, but... Uh, we'll keep working on the speaker thing. We'll see how we do. But I think it's on, where am I on? Am I on this one? Yeah, I'm on this laptop for uh, microphone. Okay. Um, so, did you guys have any questions from the homework? The quizzes? I have a clarification. Okay. Um, when making a decision, we shouldn't take into factor sub cost, fixed cost. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. So the question was, do we ignore sunk costs, fixed costs, and overhead? It depends. Sunk cost, always. So we're going to go over a, a kind of a, they call it a cost taxonomy, just kind of a, a delineation of costs, uh, similar to what we did, about, did last time, um, into avoidable and unavoidable costs. The main thing with sunk costs is that you will never recover it. It's money spent and it's gone. Fixed costs were different. How were fixed costs different? Fixed costs were different than sunk costs. There's just a subtle difference. It's not easy to catch, honestly. Fixed costs eventually can be reduced. Good, good. So uh, in terms of a stock flow concept, which is even more challenging perhaps, what is the difference between those two? What makes a fixed cost fixed? You, you said it pretty good there, by the way. But is it a flow variable or a stock variable? Does it have meaning over a period of time or at a point in time? By the way, I love when students make mistakes and they're just courageous and they throw out some answer and they're just bold. So uh, I was kind of like that. So I, I kind of appreciate uh, that type of boldness. At the same time, I will tell you straight up, no, that's not right. But that's OK, <laughs> right? So I want to have that kind of openness with you, right? So, so flow variable or stock variable for fixed cost over a period of time or at a point in time? I'm going to guess stock because you paid it at a point in time. Okay. Everybody agree with that? I would. <laughs> if you're, let, let me just put out, if you go uh, a five-year lease in a commercial setting, have you paid all of that money? No. So you can contract yourself into a fixed cost that comes at a future date. So it has not been spent already. Um, so a real tricky one, now that I'm on the lease thing and I was in the real estate business, um, you might consider, uh, well, this depends. I guess once you get into the court system, you could sue for back rent. But um, when you've paid the rent and it's, it's gone and done, and maybe it's past the statute of limitations, that might be a good example. So let's say there's a two-year statute of limitations so that if you had a dispute with your landlord, you can't go more back, you know, back further than two years, which I'm not even sure that would apply. Statute of limitations is probably longer than that for that. But 
um, that would be sunk, right? It's, you can't be recovered at all. So you contracted for a fixed cost over the five year period. Your rent's gonna be $5,000 a month no matter how much you sell, right? So fixed costs were uh, defined by whether they varied with the amount of output that you produce or not. And so as long as that doesn't change with your output, it's called a fixed cost. So the fixed cost is more of a flow variable because there's a period of time involved with it. So it's the, in fact, in the most general sense, the long run is the amount of time in which at least one factor of production is fixed. So whatever you do, if you're John Deere factory and whatever resource you are kind of obligated to or you can't change for the longest period of time, essentially establishes your long run versus your short run. Contrast that with a guy who does photography out of his basement, right? If you do photography out of your basement, how long is your long run? Now, if you're tracking with me, what, what constitutes the long run? So Overland Park, give me an example of a resource for the photography business. Anything that comes to mind. A camera, good. How long does it take to get a new camera? How long did it take to write down the Best Buy? There you go. It could be Best Buy. Now, maybe if it's, let's just say that it's a, a specialized fancy camera that you get that you just can't buy off the shelf at Best Buy. How long does it take you to get that camera? How, how much have we added on to the time? Five days, five to ten days, right? You order a you call up the specialty camera shop out of Manhattan, New York, and they ship it to you in five to 10 days, right? Can you think of any resource that might take longer than five to 10 days? Running a photography business out of your basement. I, you dream as big as you want to dream, you're right. No, that, that's exactly what you want to think about. Maybe that takes what? 30 days? Can you imagine it taking longer than 30 days? You know, and if you want to be cautious, add 15 more days onto that. Can you imagine anything taking longer than 45 days? Probably not. So the long run for a photography business out of the basement is just 45 days. If you're John Deere making tractors, your long run might be two and a half years on how, long, how much time it takes. Oops, I'm gonna do an extra credit point. I did not silence my phones. Ryan, this is uh, the new Ryan. We got two Ryans now. Um, part of the syllabus is to silence all, disconnect yourself from the outside world completely. So if you have a vibrate setting on your phone, turn it off. Turn off all instant messaging, all email if you're on a laptop, all that kind of stuff. Completely disconnect yourself. I can see you guys in Overland Park too, so if I see too much nose diving, uh, I'll be watching you, right? just like this. But everybody who's here tonight gets a little extra credit point for uh, my mishap of not turning off my phone. Okay, so long run is not a time period really at all. It's a time period that's defined by the particular business that you're analyzing. So the long run is the period of time in which at least one factor of production, one resource is held fixed. Whether that's 45 days or two and a half years, it's a period of time that at least one factor of production is held fixed. That is the long run. Because as Ryan pointed out last week, uh, as things come up, as your lease comes up, you can change anything over a long enough period of time. So in the long run, how do we characterize all costs of production? Are they variable or fixed? They're all variable. All costs are variable in the long run. We can change anything we want if we give ourselves a far enough time horizon. Let that lease run out, you know, whatever the case is. All costs are variable in the long run. Okay, now, contrasting that with uh, sunk costs, though. Sunk costs, again, are money that's paid. Not obligated to, but it's gone. It, it cannot be recovered. And so those types of costs should not be factored into marginal cost, which is part of the heart of tonight's uh, lecture as well. So, all right, other questions? Um, 
I don't remember exactly how the how the book lays it out, but was it kind of the lack of government creating wealth? Okay. So I need to switch one the thing. They, the way they talk about it was like, because of taxes, a deal may not be made. If you're a lot of amount of money, two hundred thousand, but your taxes are so much and so high, oh. the wealth won't be created because you cannot make that deal. The deal won't go through. That it keeps a deal from happening. Yeah. And yes. And another way they talk about that is uh, some local sort of subsidies. Okay. So um, Justin, right? Justin was commenting that uh, there was that part where the government um, may have a tax that's so high it keeps somebody from doing something, and that can cause wealth to be stifled or wealth creation to be stifled. But were you speaking more about whether the government creates wealth at all, or can you expand on that at all, Jesse? Or yeah, so we had that one question of, oh, there's do you remember where this was? Oh, the ones that couldn't, the ones that probably didn't get in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's possible. So, um, uh, so difference between a tax and a subsidy, what is it? Well, a tax is when you're taking income from someone. Okay. Right? And then a subsidy is when you're giving money back. Okay. So when, when the government's subsidizing an activity, they're effectively encouraging it, correct? Yes. All right. So what I think the book was bringing up in that particular point was that if we um, tax somebody else, we might, that, that's uh, unique to that group, we might be effectively subsidizing somebody else, right? So wind energy is probably a good example of this. So if we got wind energy and coal, by us providing, in this case, subsidies to wind, we're kind of, in a sense, taxing coal because people would be using coal instead of wind if wind was more expensive. You follow the logic? So if, if we're, if we're taxing and or subsidizing one, we're taking away from some other activity. And the government needs to be very careful when they get into that activity because are they sure they're making the right choice, right? They'll claim that, well, wind energy is self-sustainable and we have wind and it's in, our, it's in the United States and it's not over in the Middle East, so that's gotta be good, right? I mean they'll make these arguments that may not be completely well thought out and may have unintended consequences that come back later too. So the market system has kind of a marvelous, to me anyway, a marvelous way of weeding out who wins and who loses. How does it happen? What happens in a free market system if the government or government bureaucrats or other small interest groups, by the way, would, would be another group that's influencing the politicians, right? How does the market system handle who wins and who loses? They kind of battle it out, don't they? Good, so competition battles it out and ultimately who survives? Which one survives? And what determines who survives? Does the government decide who, they, who survives? No, because I'm talking about the free market. Basically, let the market work itself out. through. They battle it out, like you said. I like the word battle there. So who survives? What's the determining factor? Price. Price, right? Price and ultimately, if we go back to our profit equation, which is what? Price. Price. I like that's a good start. Uh, Times the quantity. I love it. 
More. Minus some cost, minus total cost, that'll work. Okay, now that's some weird kind of variation. I didn't put it out as pretty as we did last week. But uh, this is total revenue minus total cost. There's your price factor. The reason that jumped out at me, because you're right, price will be um, sorted out. But ultimately, price factors into this equation, right? And it's profits that are going to do it, or losses. And if the losses are big enough, one of them goes out of business, right? And possibly it's two wind energy producers that are battling out the wind front, right? And there's multiple coal producers. So we can step back and say, well, let's look at energy production, or let's look at energy production through wind, right? So who gets the subsidy? Is it company A, B, or C? Well, company C knows the wife of the vice president, and so company C gets it, right? So that's where we start getting the political process and, and having self-interest work its way into the political economy and cause problems. Whereas if we leave the market alone, that's the mechanism that sorts it out. The argument that some people make against letting the market do it is to say, well, the market's got problems too. Well, there's greed and there's this and there's that. And uh, if, they're, if we're producing coal, well, that's melting the icebergs up, in, up north and that's a problem. I'm not denying that it might not be a problem. I'm just saying that's kind of the arguments that need to be looked at very carefully on what are the marginal impacts of another unit of production of energy made through electricity. You know, it, what is it, what is it not? And so if we have these issues of what's called externalities, now we might have to go in and steer uh, production towards a safer one. Because it is not fair, the economists would agree, to allow the coal plant to use air for free to use 2013's air to the detriment of people in the year 2065. You follow what I mean? They're using a resource, right? By the production of electricity, they're using a resource today, but getting it for free. That causes an inefficiency. That's what we need to kind of be careful of. That's not easy to get our hands around always. But now we can start thinking about using maybe government policy of tax and subsidy to assist one or the other. But you can see it's a slippery slope when we start getting into how much do we subsidize, how much do we tax, are we better off at the end of the day just kind of letting the free market take over, or do we run the risk of having the politicians come in and screwing it more up than the market would have screwed it up anyway, right? All tough questions. Okay, how is that, Jesse? Very good, thanks. Okay, anybody else? All right, so um, I sent you out uh, an email earlier, just about an hour ago. Um, this week, I will send out an email with uh, some short answer problems like we talked about. This week, I, th this first week, I just wanted you guys to get kind of with the technology, kind of get your arms around all that, and then we'll get you started on some of the short answer problems. Um, what I sent you was the answers to the short answer problems that I'm going to assign. So what you guys need to be doing is working through the problems kind of honestly to yourselves. Where this is going to come to catch you is if you just kind of copy the answer and don't really know what the heck you're doing, you will fail the final. The final's going to be tough. Questions on the final will be similar to this in logic to some of the questions you'll get on, some of the questions anyway, will be similar to, the, to this type of content. And so you need to really work through it on your own. I learned the best this way is, is the way in graduate school and other, at other times. So I've always been a big believer in, in homework problems, having you have the answers so that you can spend your time, work, look at the answers. Well, why did they get that answer? Kind of go back and forth because uh, some of these are, are challenging. And so you'll have the opportunity to see where the answers are and kind of work through it in your own brain on uh, getting the right answer. So um, 
What you should not be doing is just perfectly cutting and pasting the answer. I sent it to you in a PDF. And so you'll be submitting this to Blackboard. And so you won't get full credit. By the way, you'll get some credit. So I mean, I'm not even going to dock you. If you've got something going on in your life, and somebody went to the emergency room, and mom and dad died, and, and whatever else, if you need to cut and paste that answer, cut and paste the answer. Learn it later. You're going to have to learn it eventually if you want to do all right on the final. But you can uh, you know, do what you need to to get through that homework and that due date. Um, it's more important to get it turned in timely and try to stay on top of this rather than to let them just accumulate. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, you brought it up. Uh, the final, will that be uh, in class, closed notes? Uh, I haven't decided yet completely, so I will hold you in suspense. But yes, right now, in a plan on an in-class final. But I can't say I've decided completely. We'll see. Anything else? All right. Oh, wow, look at this little guy. I made it right up to my, sorry, those of you who are pacifists. Gosh, I can't believe you made it all the way up to my table. Oh, cricket. OK. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. Um, well, let's work through some of, uh, I, I've got some PowerPoints um, prepared for tonight. And we're going to start by actually looking through uh, some of chapter three again. And I, I'm anticipating moving through this a little bit quicker. I will send these out after each night so that you guys have copies of these as well. Um, we're going to start off. Can you guys see the big screen now OK? A little crooked? Oh, I might be able to fix that. Let me let me blow it up first. Oh, I see. It's that. Oh, yeah. Okay. See, it's hard to kind of tell which, uh, which screen it is. Um, we're gonna watch a little video. It's this one, I think I can make better for you. It's this one that I'm wiggling. Can you see that one? All right. See the shaky? <laughs> that one I've got set up right in front of the screen. This is a different one. I suppose I could do this one a little bit better, too. This is two angles for you. All right, we'll get this figured out. By the, by the eighth, mar the, by the marginal eighth week, we will have this stuff down, so. Okay, here's a video. Milton Friedman. Um, let me just pause. This is uh, anybody recognize this guy? Who is it? Bill Donahue. Bill Donahue from the 1970s. So one of my favorite economists is is Milton Friedman, and uh, he was pretty influential um, promoting free markets and capitalism. And uh, he's one of my favorite economists uh, back in the 1970s. And so he's on the Phil Donahue show, and Phil starts drilling him with some questions the way. Uh, Phil Donahue does so. Yeah, I thought about that. Let's see if we go crazy here on. Uh, let's see, how do I do that? that must be, oh wait, I no. Once it goes, I should pick it up on this. You guys, tell me if you can hear this audio once I start it. Okay, hold on, I haven't started yet. I'm thinking my microphone will pick it up. But we're not. Oh, you're saying I have to unmute this? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Ah. Okay. So let's see. Uh, well, you can hear now. Okay. I got an idea. Let's see. How's it gonna work, though? If you mute that microphone, maybe it'll work. If I mute that one, and maybe, yeah, I guess I can try that. This is the mic. This is kind of the mystery microphone right now. I'm not sure if it works or how it works. Okay, so if I mute that, didn't 
customary in the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the mass Can you guys hear that? The kind of riding popping you're talking about. The only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capital. Overland Park, can you hear me? If you want to know where the masses are worst, worst off, can you guys hear me? Is this thing working? In the kinds Two. of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear. That there is no they seem to be watching so far discovered of improving the law of the ordinary. If they can hear it, I don't know how. Can you guys hear that? Us in Kansas City? Yeah. No, no. Okay, I thought you <laughs> I, I thought you probably couldn't. Um let me try we have a link to it. We can watch it. Yeah, why don't if you guys got the link, why don't you go ahead and watch it separately? Okay. Although I'd be tempted to try one more technique, but um, yeah, let's just if you let's roll with that. Well, let me. You know what? Let me. No, we can watch it. We'll get back to you in a minute. All right. How did you get the link? Did you just pull it off? No, it's in our book. It's in the front chapter of our book. Oh, okay. All right, we'll do it that way. Yeah. Experiment maybe on the break. When you see the greed and the concentration of power of the people, All right. when you see around the world the maldistribution of wealth, oh. the, the desperate plight of millions of people from underdeveloped countries, uh, when you see so few haves and so many have nots, when you, when you see the greed and the concentration of power of the people, well, haven't you ever, haven't you ever had a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me. Is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? Do you think Russia doesn't run on greed? Do you think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow that's greedy. <laughs> this, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government gifts. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of riding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worst, worst off, worst off, it's exactly from the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activity that are unleashed by free enterprise. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. And what does reward virtue? Do you think the uh, communist commissar rewards virtue? Do you think a Hitler rewards virtue? Do you think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me, where in the world do you find these angels who are going to organize society for us? Well, I don't even trust you to do that. All right, you guys make it through that?
this problem. just says introduction. Let me try to get a little bit tighter shot. Armadillos, is that what it says? Armadillos? Yeah. yeah, it's armadillo appliances. Okay, so somebody's trying to minimize cost. Uh, they found a supplier that's a penny less, and they ended up finding out after the fact that costs went up by seventy-five thousand. What did they forget? And I think this one, this one was in the text, wasn't it? Here was the old supplier. Here's their company. Here's the new supplier. Right. So there's more to the problem than just looking at per unit cost. So that starts us off trying to, trying to figure out, uh, thinking a little more critically about things, about all the costs that might be uh, applied to a, a particular situation. All right, so, because um, we spent a lot of time the last time looking at implicit costs and explicit costs. In this case, this would have been an explicit cost if there was a uh, transportation charge coming. Um, we went through total costs and variable costs. Again, this part of this is a review. I wanted to get to some of the, the problems. So let's just kind of review. You got a little candy uh, vending machine. My dad did this once for a little stint. A uh, big lesson for him in running a little small business. So payments to your accountants to prepare your tax returns. Fixed or variable? Fixed. Electricity to run the candy making machines. Good. What was the answer? Variable. Variable. This is for the candy making machines. If it was a vending machine, then it'd probably be fixed. Just a certain amount of time to keep it on. Fees to design the packaging of your candy bar. Fixed. Right? For advertising, fixed. And cost of material for packaging. Variable. Variable. All right. So we immediately start thinking about. Um, costs that vary with production, costs that don't. And if you think about this to some of your previous accounting classes, that already is something a little bit different, right? Because, uh, well, Ryan, you were the accounting major. I mean, you kind of, you don't always think about it that way. The, the economic way of thinking about it is a little bit different. We're just immediately uh, associating stuff with decision making. Okay, so give this a read. Can you guys read that? It seems a little light. It's not a laptop screen, though. Can you guys see that? Not very well. Is it the top part that you're having problems with? Uh, yeah, bullets one and two is difficult to read. Okay. Yeah, this one is, yeah. But there'll be some that we're not. Okay, so they've got $4 million worth of real estate sitting on their balance sheet. So they have a, if the value of the condominiums is $4 million, stock variable or flow variable? Stock, good. Any, anything balance sheet is going to be a stock variable. So at a point in time, it's the value of something. So whenever your balance sheet, that should ring a bell that it's talking about a stock variable, the value at a point in time. So assume that there's a 10% opportunity cost. What does that mean? What does the 400000 mean? Why are we doing that?
Interest. For what? Are they earning interest? Okay, are they charging it? Are they being charged interest from the creditors for that? No, they're not. The opportunity cost is what they could be using that $4 million. What they could be doing, yes. And so this is something that has gotten attention from a lot of CEOs the last 20 years, very much thinking about opportunity costs. If you're sitting fat on a bunch of machinery, tools, real estate in this example, you could, in theory, sell it and be earning something. If these things are just sitting vacant, when you go to do your income statement, the accountant doesn't allow you a line item for lost interest that you could have earned, right? But it's very significant. So it's not hard for a decision, making, a decision maker in a company to maybe be deceived a bit by sitting fat on a bunch of assets that are not being productive and then they're still earning a profit. So let's just say they were earning a positive profit while letting these apartments go to waste. They could have been doing a lot better. Their shareholders would like to see them doing something with that $4 million worth of assets, right? So. This uh, EVA calculation is something that's gained popularity. So the economic value added takes into account those implicit costs off the balance sheet. And um, I, what's, at, what's at the decision maker's discretion is how much they put on the 10%. Should that be 10%? Should that be 15%? Should that be 8%? Should that be 4%? Should that be 3%? I don't have an answer for you. That's what their decision is of the company. Now they might hire a consultant to determine what that was, what that is, but that's really um, the decision maker's choice and that is going to have an impact on uh, profits ultimately on what they deem that opportunity cost to be. Okay, so here's an example. So if we have, um, accounting profit at the end of the day of 431 pounds. We had some sales, price times quantity, P times Q. We got that going on on the top part of the income statement. Then we start getting into operating expenses. Now, what's the distinction here with operating income? I know we all haven't had accounting or we haven't had it for a long time. So those who know a little bit more, probably more than I do, you know, what's the distinction between these costs and these costs? Just look at their titles. What do you see as a difference? Okay, how though, how is it being spent? So if I look at um, just these expenses and just these expenses, where is it here, right here. These expenses and these expenses. What's different about them? Okay, to make the product. So it's it's a little tighter to variable cost, right? Aren't these more variable costs in general? They might not be, by the way, completely. This is not a perfect distinction between accounting books and economic books. But a lot of times these will be more operational, especially when we get into depreciation. That's just the IRS that allows us a little tax benefit by claiming something that's gone down in value even though it might have gone up. These apartments they might have purchased for uh, $2 million. They now have a market value of $4 million, but the IRS has allowed them to depreciate them to $1 million, right? So there's a big difference between what the IRS lets us do for tax purposes and what's really going on with the business in terms of the books. But nonetheless, when you see the gross profit uh, numbers, and this is total operating expenses, we got kind of this operating income. The thought is, is if somebody came in and paid cash for the business, they could probably step into the business and that's what they would expect to make. Right? In theory, kind of just operating income, operating expenses. When we get down here, we start maybe taking on a loan. Well, one guy's got a 50% loan to value on this thing. Another guy comes in and he's paying full cash. Another guy has an 80% loan to value, right? 
the amount of money, whether you bring it in fully leveraged or whether it's your own cash, that's gonna change the answer down here. So this stuff above the line deals more with operations and a lot of times will be tied more closely with variable cost, although stuff like rent could be in there too, by the way. So um, this is more of the operating business. This is more financing. So other income, uh, let's see, they don't even have another income thing, but there might have been some weird income that you got in that particular year. It's not really related to you doing business, but you sold some, some capital asset or something else, or you had some little side job that's not normal. Okay, questions or comments on that? The accountant, though, missed out on that implicit cost of sitting fat on those apartments in India. So if our opportunity cost was 12%, then we would have had an implicit cost on the 4 million of 480, I got million, but that's 480,000, I think. But anyway, you know, let's see, this was in millions, but um, this number should have been a negative number if we took into account the implicit costs, right? So economic profit are always less than accounting profits is what we went through uh, in that, those first couple chapters last week. Questions or comments on that? So the implicit cost are like just costs that you disallow by your uh, Yes. Anything that, um, when we use ex, the word explicit, what makes it explicit is that you paid for it with real dollars and you wrote a check for it and your accountant agrees with it and I keep looking now over to you, you're my resident accountant now, but uh, um, although, what, did you do double in accounting too? Can't remember, no? Just marketing. You were marketing, okay. Um, so all of those expenses, the IRS and your accountant would agree with, explicit cost. When we start thinking into what you could have done had you not done what you did, that's opportunity cost. That's the implicit part of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is both explicit and implicit cost. But now we're getting into a little bit more of an art form and it kind of depends on the situation. So that's what I called economic art. Okay. So really it's not really a negative, it's just the, the basic double. <clears throat> well, you, you tell me. So Skyler said, uh, let me go to Denise and Jesse. So Skyler said, it's not really negative. It's just that you could have made more than this. So can you guys see this number okay? Not that we're getting into that type of detail, but can you see anything on that spreadsheet? At 431. Yeah. So that was our accounting profit. And... What was missing from that was that opportunity cost of 12% had an implicit cost of 480, which if we were to factor that in would make this approximately a negative 50. And so what Skyler commented was, well, it's not really a negative 50. What do you think? That's fine, that's fine, that's what we're all about. They're not really using it, right. So is it a real negative 50? You definitely. So what's real and what's not? Is this real? Did we really make 431? What's real and what's not? That's part of what this class is all about, I think. Does it make it real because the Internal Revenue Service accepts that as a profit? Is that why it's real for you? Or did you really lose 50000 because you made a bonehead decision on leaving these uh, condos vacant and you really screwed your shareholders over by mismanaging their money, having $4 million in India sitting vacant, not doing anything? What's real? I would argue they lost 50 million, right? 
in terms of the decision making that was going on, they lost 50 million. I'm completely biased though. I'm ready to be challenged by you guys. Just fight me, put on your gloves. But what is your reality? My reality is a $50 million loss. Your reality, if you're an accountant or if you're an IRS agent, might be that you made 431 and you owe me taxes of 20% times 431, right? Which makes your decision all the more bonehead probably of not, not selling it, but that's a different issue because now you're gonna have a cash flow problem going into the next time period when you have to pay taxes on this that you didn't take into account, right? And you really didn't have the money for. All right, so yes, I'm ready to be I'm ready to be challenged, but what is your reality? I want you guys to be pushing and thinking when you get into your next position. I want you to be thinking kind of the economic way. That's part of what this class is all about, to be thinking about the things that the accountant doesn't think about. That's what a good manager does. That's what a good boss does. That's what a good owner does. These are the people making decisions on a day in and day out basis, and you have to sometimes weed through the numbers that might be perfectly sound numbers but to make a good decision you have to read more into it and that's what we're doing with this class is trying to read more into it why, why would they overlook why would they what You know, it, it, honestly, this, this is a very, in fact, this, this author, this is one of the reasons I chose this material, uh, picks out real world situations. So this really happened. This, this was a real case study. And uh, it would not be hard for people to do that. I mean, even in a, a number of the businesses that I operated in, you just, you don't always think about that. It gets kind of like, oh, we gotta look at the numbers, we gotta look at this. And you're not always thinking about, well, what else could we be doing? You're so focused in on, um, you know the labor costs and the some of the operating costs that you kind of forget about the fact that you're sitting on this other opportunity this other asset that's out there or whatever you know that could be done and so if you're the young person on the corporate ladder and at the meeting you say well you know we've got those condos uh, nobody's using them I, I called the the property manager over there in India, I know nobody really talks to them, but I found out they're sitting completely vacant. You know, if we sold those, that would uh, kind of help the bottom line next year. How do you look to the bosses and the VPs and the president all of a sudden, right? You're just jump. you're reading more into the numbers. You're not focusing on what, what's there, but what's not there. Focus in on what's not there to really think critically about the issues. Yeah, I think that was part of the part of the story that they originally bought it. They were going to open up a branch office in India, and, and they were going to provide housing as part of their package because it was India or something like that. Yeah. So obviously it didn't go. Didn't go. Didn't fly. And yeah. So not hard for some of that to possibly. You know, this is just one example, but. Um, not hard for some of those details to fall through the cracks. The, the main point is, is that without a system like EVA in place in your company, and, and, and by the way, there are, play, there are systems now in place that would catch that. If that's not there, you might look at this and say, oh, well, we're doing pretty good, and you know, overlook that, that balance sheet item. Okay. Um, oh, let's see. Let's well, we could probably look at this one since we're having so much fun. Okay. So, <clears throat> give this a read here. So, we're thinking about outsourcing a washing machine. So, that this uh, annual unit volume is a million. Depreciation refers to straight line depreciation of a million. Initial tooling costs equal to 100,000 per year, 10 years. None of this really matters too much than here. So material, internal production, material, labor, depreciation, overhead. So what do we got for cost? Dollar. Outsourcing it to some company overseas, maybe in India, who knows? Material, labor, tooling, 70 cents. 
Deal. Done. Let's do it. Let's ship, ship this thing overseas and not have to mess with it. But is that the case? Could be, yeah, there might be, there could be some um, transportation like that. Yep, that would be a possibility. Do we have bad faith, like if you pull out of the United States um, city? Okay. Maybe guilt for Illinois. Be more on the, which would be more on the revenue side, right? Uh, what about these costs? This is what the accountant came up with. Hint, hint. This is what the accountant came up with. Okay, so there might be a little bit of uh, cost associated with transitioning over. Okay, what else? So this is if we do it ourselves, this is if we outsource it. Well, okay, now you're touching on it. We got spreading out overhead. Are we going to have overhead anyway? No. Yeah. So should we should that enter into our decision here on cost? If we're going to have that overhead anyway, if that's a salaried person, no. That one just gets deleted, right? So that one should not be in there. Depreciation? Are we going to still have depreciation if we own the asset anyway or whatever we've got? Yes. Right? So the real decision comes down to possibly 80 cents ourselves. 70 cents overseas. Now we start playing the games of some of the other things you guys brought up with transportation, if there's other issues, if we affect our clients. But we didn't need to be factoring these costs into the decision at the margin. What's the decision at the margin? Should I go outsource it or should I keep production here myself, right? That's the decision at the margin. What costs belong in the decision at the margin? And so some of these don't apply to a marginal analysis. Some of them are just not applicable because they're either fixed or they're sunk. Why is there overhead outsourcing? That's not known to you guys? Uh, why is there not overhead over here? Yeah, why is it not? Well, they were internally, and again, we're kind of reading a little bit into this, but they were internally allocating out probably 10% of a dollar. You know, all 10% of every dollar spent goes towards this or something. So it was an allocation of overhead, which isn't uncommon to do um, when we had uh, uh, multiple operations. So we ran a, a property, one of the businesses was a property management company, and we did our own internal maintenance because it was often hard to outsource that to other companies. If a tenant has a problem, you know, at midnight, who's gonna come, who's gonna call? So we kept our own staff, and then we also hired out some of that. But we ran into that too, where when we're doing the books at the end of the year, we might take um, some of the salaries or other overhead of the office and allocate that out to the maintenance division, right? So we had this maintenance division, we kind of allocate it out, and that's kind of what this is hinting at. But if you're gonna have that overhead anyway, then it doesn't belong in the decision-making at the margin. Okay. So, uh, hidden cost, um, sunk cost, another football game. I think we mentioned a ball game last time too. Um, you know, what's if you bought season tickets for the Ottawa Braves and you've spent all of your hundred dollars for going to ten games, you know, what does it cost you for uh, skipping that night? You know, what is the marginal cost? of whether you should go to the game that night. So it's the fifth game of the season, and you're thinking, oh, should I go, should I not? Well, what's it going to cost me? $10. Jesse, no? I hear some other no's. Why? You've already paid for it, right. Now, the average cost of that ticket would be $10, but that's not the marginal cost of going that night. That money's already been spent, it's gone. Now, if you have an opportunity to scalp that ticket, standing outside the Braves Center, you know how popular those Braves games are, you could probably get at least five bucks for that ticket, I'm sure. Now, so if you had an opportunity to scalp the ticket, then what would be your cost 
of going, your marginal cost associated with going. Whatever you could get for the scalp price, right? So that would be in factored in as part of your cost. Why? Because it's recoverable, right? You could get that cost back. So that effectively represents the monetary cost associated with skipping the game that night. Okay. What about this guy? Should we fire him? Jesse, can you read that all right? Yeah, I can. It's just kind of funny from an HR perspective question. Well, good. Then we'll let you take it here. Let uh, the revenue he provides to the company is $2,500. He's got $1,900 per month. In wages, his office could be rented for eight hundred. So, on a purely numbers basis, should he be fired? It's just numbers. I mean, you're gonna make or you're gonna save more. So he makes hundred dollars, right, from him? Um, on the nineteen, yes, because nineteen hundred per month. On this explicit cost of his wages and twenty-five hundred dollars is what he brings in. So yeah, six hundred is what they get there. Yeah, but if you let him go, then he's at eight hundred a month. Right. Yeah, you just let him go. So can him, he's out of here, right? So again, implicit cost. Implicit cost that changes the decision. Most of the time you might not be thinking about this. Again, you might be at that meeting with your bosses and you're like, this doesn't even come up. And you say, well, you know, we could maybe rent his apartment or his uh, office suite for 800. Oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. Gustavo, that's great, you're promoted. I'll give you a $5,000 raise here too, by the way, while we're at it, All right? So that's the type of thing, that's the type of thing we're looking for. Okay, um, towards the end of this chapter, we had some uh, different types of biases that were uh, brought up. Let me let you read through those and ask if any of them sticks out for you as something you've found yourself prey to. Let's see, Denise. I haven't heard from you yet very much. I think we heard a little bit, but any of these bi any of these biases uh, strike a chord with you? Yeah, I hate to say it, but that confirmation bias looks awfully familiar. Ah, yeah, confirmation bias. That's a good one. So you find out what confirms what you believe, and then you stop, right? You don't want to, well, as long as I got a little bit of evidence, I must be right, right? So that's a, that's a good one. Who else? Which other ones stick out for you? Me too. That's, that's probably the one I was going to jump on. A uh, little tendency to place too much confidence in the accuracy. So I would build these spreadsheets when I was starting to figure out a business and, you know, oh, well, we can do this and we can do this. And if it all works out this way, we make this much money. And that was probably a little too confident in those numbers in, in some cases. I did make money in some other cases, but uh, I'd say in general I'd fall prey to, to that. Um, this endowment effect, I got one little interesting one to tell you about. Um, I think we'll see it a few times in the text mentioned, but there's an area of economics called experiential economics where you do experiments. And so we test economic theory. A lot of it, in general, is called behavioral economics, where we look at people's behavior. And one of the experiments was the uh, professor had people come into class, and uh, everybody had a mug on their desk. And so the uh, professor said, I got a sheet of paper in front of you. I'd like you to put a value of the mug. And so people looked at the mug and said, oh, that's pretty nice. And, I suppose a couple bucks, so they, they would write down their answers. Then in a separate test, they came in, the students came in and said, hey, the professor said, I got good news for you. The university's giving you all a mug. So these mugs that are in front of you are yours. 
And uh, what I'd like to do is just ask you, what do you think it's worth? And now all of a sudden, oh, well, it's probably like four or five dollar mug, right? As soon as people thought that they owned it, they started to place a higher value on it. That's what the endowment effect is. So you've maybe seen this with people's houses. I saw it all the time, the endowment effect, when I sold real estate. Well, what's your house worth? Well, geez, I think it's probably worth 160,000, you know, where you'd be lucky to get 140 out of it. So if they own it, all of a sudden it has more meaning to them and they tend to be deceived about the, what the true value is because of this ownership effect. Okay, any other questions or comments there? All right, let's see. I think this is going to be, we're going to skip this one, I think. All right. So that was kind of a quick summary of, of um, some chapter three stuff. Um, the reason I wanted to go through that was it ties in nicely to the decisions at the margin, which is what uh, which is what we're focusing in on tonight. And so that's why I um, brought things back around to uh, to a marginal analysis again. So. Um, have a quick flyby of, of cost. Um, marginal cost and average cost. What's the difference, Ryan? Ryan, can't remember your guys' last name. Green, right? Ryan G. Average cost versus marginal cost. How would you describe that? Okay, so average is what you set it at, marginal is what the market sets it at. No. Gustavo. Uh, I think average is a very unit value. The what is the average or the marginal? The average. Okay, and what's marginal? No, because they're both per unit. So I'll give you a little hint. The answer is no, because they're both per unit. Uh, Jesse. Uh, yeah, I guess I was going Jesse, Ottawa, Jesse. Okay. Average cost is your total cost divided by your number of units, and marginal cost is how much it's going to cost to produce one more. One more, case. good. All right, good. So Jesse said the average cost, and by the way, what Jesse did there was good, went back to the definition. Remember last time I said, have those definitions memorized, right? So pull out a sheet of paper right now, a blank sheet of paper. We're going to have a little pop quiz. No looking back at your old notes. A blank sheet of paper, pull it out. I want to see who's got that formula memorized that I told you to memorize last week. So Ryan, you're probably SOL on this. This is just extra credit. <laughs> New Ryan, accounting Ryan. So blank sheet of paper. I'm going to look at you guys too, Denise and Jesse. No looking at each other's papers, but you can hold them up to the camera. So go. You got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, do I not get this thing for you? Uh, the formula with total cost and average cost, the big cost formula. What was that big cost formula? That kind of related total costs and the averages. All right, Overland Park, hold them up to the camera as soon as you got them. Oh, oh, I like that. Whose is that? Jesse's? Jesse, yeah. All right. That's an A. Oh, wait. No, it's not. Wait, wait a second. Put that back up there. 
I think I made up some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so good at first, but no, it's wrong. It's wrong. I know, it's totally wrong. Okay, all right, good. Where's Denise's? I need to practice some more. All right, where's Denise's? Not yet. You just bowed out? Okay, what do we got? Pass them up, Ottawa people. Let's see them. Oh, boy. Looks like we need some more. Skyler's probably holding down this one, too. Okay. Ooh. Okay, well, that was a good start, yeah. I had kind of a unique thing that I added to it. Oh! Oh, so close, Gustavo. <laughs> so close, but yet... Ah, oh, so close. These two are a tie for mediocrity. <laughs> um, not so good, not so good. All right, so here is the tie for mediocrity. I don't know if you guys can see this. Over in the park, can you see this? Uh, yeah, let me switch it to the main screen. Oh, wait, which one are you on here? This one? Yeah, that one. Oh, okay. Oh. So this, wow. is, this is the tie for mediocrity. None of these are really good. So next week, we're going to probably do the same quiz. Okay. okay. This is another one that's probably the best. So that looks kind of like mine. Yeah, Gustavo, it, actually, all you did was screw up one. You were dyslexic on the first, the very first term. You put T-A-C which I could almost accept as total average cost, but ATC. But yeah, you, you basically but I have it. I know. I know, you get an extra credit point. I, you're good. I'll take that. <laughs> All right, so here it is. Everybody get ready. Um, so, uh, and Ryan Accountant had, had a good start here. He was missing out on part of it. So we broke total cost into two parts. Those that vary with quantity, those that do not vary with quantity. So that's the relationship of total cost. Now, sometimes we like to look at things on a per unit basis, right? So on a per unit basis, we divide by the number of units, divide by Q. What we do to one side of the equal sign, we gotta do to the other side of the equal sign. The reason we did that is because it gives us an, another nice relationship that we'll use quite a bit, and that is that the average total cost is equal to the sum of average variable cost and average fixed cost. And that's it. I think I did the bottom equation. Yes, you did, you, yours was uh, right up there too, yes. You were, you were the yellow sheet, right? Yeah. Oh, that wasn't you? Which one was you? Oh, you had the bottom part. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Jesse Becker. You had the bottom part, but this was not right. This is terrible here. This is like F. But this is okay, but you needed the totals dividing by the quantity. It's real important that you get all of those pieces down. Now, this isn't even the question we were getting to that we still haven't gotten addressed. Do not confuse average and marginal cost. So, Jesse, you correctly define marginal cost as what? The cost of the next produced. The cost of the next unit. Okay, so um, the marginal cost is different in that we're going to look at the change in total cost derived from a change in quantity. And so watch how close this formula is. We did not do this one last week, so this is kind of new. Marginal cost, the formula would be the change in total cost from a change in quantity. So if I'm currently making 104 units, what would be the cost of 105 uh, unit? Right? The 105th, the extra unit, the marginal unit. If I'm making 33 units, what is the cost of the 34th unit? So the cost of an additional unit of production. That's what this formula is going to give you. Because if we were currently having uh, $400,000 worth of cost, and we increased 10 units, so the change in total cost was 400000 
and we increased 10 units. So we added 10 more units and that added $400,000 worth of cost. Each one of those at the margin, again, we're kind of averaging, by the way, over those 10 units, but incrementally speaking, we would be adding about 40,000 per unit of marginal cost, right? Each one of those extra 10 units was running me about 40 grand. So maybe that's apparently a higher end sports car, maybe it's some sort. Although it'd probably be a American made sports car of some sort. All right, now, um, I wanna link these two together for a second here, because this brings up another important point. So if I put these, this is a little shorthand notation with math that means change, right? So if we did rise over run, it's the change in this over the change in that. So if you can kind of think of the slope in some cases with marginal. And if I tie this back to this formula, well, heck, we could look at the change in total variable cost from a change in quantity plus the change in total fixed cost from a change in quantity. That might be another way to look at marginal cost. But this can be simplified. Look at that equation with those two terms. How could that be simplified? Okay, no, I love the way you started off and hated the way you ended. <laughs> nope, I'm not looking for that. That's kind of where, yeah, that's where Gabby was going. So, now, I want to I wanna, hang on every word I say right now. The change in variable cost from a change in production, the change in fixed cost from a change in production. Does that help anybody out? The change in fixed oh, cost. Get rid of the, fixed cost. the fixed costs don't change, right? So fixed costs don't change by definition, right? So just get rid of that. And the reason that's important to digest is it all ties into our break even analysis and all of that jazz is that you're really only looking at variable cost when you're looking at the margin. So marginal cost has really two formulas because they're really one and the same. The only reason total costs are changing when I change production is because total variable costs are changing, right? So they're one and the same. So you need to know both of those uh, variations right here of calculating marginal cost. Yes. We can't see the board. Oh, yeah, you probably can't. Let's see. Thank you. I'm sorry. Now, I just shifted that one. I suppose you wanted this one shifted, huh? I'm going to try to keep. Have you been looking at this one for the screen, the one I'm pointing my finger to? Yeah, and the other one was pointed at the screen, too. It didn't move. And, and that one didn't, uh, that wasn't doing anything for you at the screen anyway? Yeah, so now I moved it. Can you see the board now, or is it too far? Uh, yeah, let me switch it so it's the main one now. Are you guys zoomed in on your laptops or not? No, but I think we will at break. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, that. I think that would be probably the best way, because then you could switch through the different screens real easy. We will Okay. All right, so that's marginal cost. Um, for the benefit of the OP people here. Um, so this is the one you guys screwed up. You guys recognize this one? OK, good. And then this is the new one for tonight, marginal cost. And the only difference is these little triangles, the change in total cost over the change in quantity. And because of the way costs change through only variable cost, you could also look at it as the change in total variable cost over the change in quantity. All right. Um, well, let's see. It looks like I got a little room on the screen here. What is this 
this a picture of from last week? Add those two curves. Now this one you can look back in your notes. Average total cost and average Good. Average total cost and average variable cost. Which one's on top? Average total cost. Average total cost. Average variable cost. All right. And the vertical distance between each curve? Average fixed cost. Average fixed cost. All right. So remember I had you draw these minimum points, the big fat dots. Now we're going to bring in marginal cost into it. The marginal cost curve is kind of J-shaped at first, and then it cuts through the minimum points of both the averages. So the marginal cost curve looks like that. Towards the end of uh, last week's lecture, I mentioned that the textbook will often hold marginal cost constant, which would just make it a flat line. So as you guys work through some of your problems, It'll just say, suppose that marginal costs are $5. Well, if marginal costs are $5 and they're constant, that would just be a flat line. This is the more traditional case where marginal cost is upward sloping. The, uh, I'm going to, I might have to send you a link, but it is on the Russ Econ Rocks website, which did, I, that was another email I sent you guys that it has last week's lecture capture. Um, unfortunately, there was a little bit of audio problems at one point on them, um, so it didn't quite capture everything, but most of the lecture is there. Um, and uh, the restaurant example is something that I'll show you, I'll, I'll have you guys um, look at to see more about marginal costs and why it's upward sloping. Here's the answer, is that it's upward sloping because of the law of diminishing marginal product. The law of diminishing marginal product. The law of diminishing marginal product is what gives rise to what's also called the law of increasing costs. And that lecture capture doesn't take too long to get through. I've abbreviated it. I've kind of heavily edited it. Um, and uh, so I think that should work through that good. Um, the gist of it is, is that as you change your resource mix and you start adding more and more uh, of a variable resource. So the example I go through that I'll, I'll just give you a quick nutshell of, because I love to do it, <laughs> is when I was in the restaurant business. And if I'm in the business of making hamburgers, and this is my grill top, so let's say that this desk is my grill, and the resource that I'm going to change is the number of workers. And I could change the number of hamburgers too, I suppose, since that would be a variable cost. But my grill top is going to be the same. So if we look at the ratio of labor to capital, I'm increasing labor, but I'm not increasing capital. So I'm changing my resource mix. Why? Capital's fixed. Right? I might be leasing out that capital for a, a year or whatever. The capital's maybe something in the long run. Labor's something I can pull the trigger on today. So as I add more and more workers, what happens to the productivity of each additional worker. So if I can make 100 hamburgers myself working all alone, what would happen if I added a second worker on? Would we together produce 200, 220, or 180? And I'm just making up numbers that are plus or minus. But what would be the likely scenario? And go ahead to kind of stretch your mind a bit 200 plus. Why do you say that? I agree that that's a possibility, but why? Um, I guess the formula. You have one employee that's going to be 100% employed to do the same thing, not more. Okay. Does everybody agree with that? I want a little bit deeper why. Okay, good. So now you've got diminishing product kicking in. Okay. But I want to argue more. Why more? Because I, I agree that 
Um, at this point, it's possible it could be more. Okay, good, specialization. So Adam Smith talked about the importance of specialization in the production process. And so what we could do separately is not necessarily the same as what we could do together. So I could patty the hamburgers while you're toasting the buns, right? Through specialization, maybe together we could do more than 200, like 220. But now stick with me, a third worker. Can we do even more with the third worker, the fourth worker, the fifth worker, the sixth worker, the seventh worker, the eighth worker? Are we going to keep experiencing those increasing returns? No, surely it. Go ahead, Jesse. That's right, and that, that's the point I wanted to bring you to, is that that's what the definition of the law of diminishing marginal product is, is that as you add more and more of a variable resource to at least one fixed resource, like the grill top, then the production or the produ productivity of that additional workers is going to eventually fall. Because like you just said, Jesse, the, the resource mix isn't compatible anymore. Right? You're getting crowded out, you're talking about what you're going to do Saturday night at the party and that sort of thing. So productivity starts to fall for those additional workers. So this has to hold logically to almost any system unless you can change all of the resources. If you can change all of the resources though, are we in the long run or the short run? you can change all of the resources you're in the long run in the long run you can change all resources in the short run at least one resource is fixed so in the short run diminishing marginal product applies as I continue to let's just again kind of pushing that example which by the way I go into great detail with numbers and everything that, on the video um, if I can hire as many people as I want at uh, $50 a day or something, the seventh worker costs me just as much as the first worker and the second worker and the third worker, right? So the cost of each additional worker is the 50 bucks. Now, if we were to graph that function, what would it look like? Would it look like this curve? Would it look like A, B, or C, if each worker, I'm trying to put a little bit of curve to this, if I can hire as many workers as I want at $40 a day, what is my total cost of labor looking like? A, B, or C? B, right? Each one is $40. So if I look at the slope, this person cost me $40, right? I went up by 40 for this person. I hired another person, another 40 bucks. This person, another 40 bucks. 40 bucks, 40 bucks, 40 bucks. So that function is linear, right? It's a line, but that's not what this is. This one's going up. Why? Because I'm measuring hamburgers here, not workers. The cost of the additional burgers that the seventh worker helped me make was actually pretty high because I'm spreading those same few burgers over the 40 bucks. So on a per unit basis, it's driving me up, right? So that's why we'd expect a marginal cost curve that's upward sloping. All right, that's pretty intense. You need to go back through the video and kind of see that. We're gonna kind of see that logic play through. Again, many times uh, we'll make a simplifying assumption that costs are constant just for other reasons that we're tackling the problem. But this is the real deal. And so uh, oftentimes managers and owners will make the wrong decision using averages instead of marginal, right? Because if I look at the average cost, let's just pick this minimum point, 
If the average cost of a hamburger is um, $4, can you see this okay, Overland Park? So I know it's kind of small over here, but if the average cost of uh, making 100 hamburgers is $4, and the cost of the 100th burger is $4, because I happened to pick that point, the manager thinks to himself, well, hey, do you think we should expand production? Should we get another one? What's another one going to cost? I don't know. What do you think? Well, I'm thinking that it costs us four bucks for one, so let's just do 101 and see what happens. Well, yeah, because, gosh, costs aren't going to go up that much. Maybe it costs us $4 and a penny, but that's not what the cost of the 101st burger is. The 101st burger, because of the law of diminishing marginal product, runs you five bucks. Oops, I guess we shouldn't have produced the 101st burger. That's the difference between analyzing something at the margin and analyzing something on average. Okay, we're going to see that theme kind of repeated uh, through this um, next two chapters, for that matter, if not the whole semester, uh, this is, and hopefully the rest of your life. You start to pick up on that, digest it, live it, love it, learn it. Okay, questions or comments there? All right. So let's see, we covered that, we covered that. Additional costs. So and again, I'll give you guys these um, PowerPoints here. So average cost is irrelevant to an extent decision. So how much are we gonna do? We don't decide how much we're gonna do based on the average. We look at the margin. Marginal cost versus marginal benefit. Companies run into this all the time. And it was fun, I, had a, I haven't maybe told you guys this, but my partner was a CPA. So um, there would be many exchanges where we'd kind of run through the logic of, of, should we change the amount of advertising? We're spending, advertising is extremely expensive. Weren't you in advertising? Or no, you were selling cell phones or something. Okay. Um, it, advertising is, is really costly and so you know that you gotta do it, but you don't know how much you should do, and you kinda don't wanna do it because you're not sure if it got the results that you wanted, and you kinda go back and forth on how do we measure that and all that stuff. So, you need to try to think about the cost and the benefits of doing more and changing it. Um, so should we change this? Should we increase the quality of service? Is your staff big enough or too big? How many parking spaces should you lease? decision after decision after decision after decision after decision when you are running a business or managing a business a lot of times this is just decisions at the margin day in and day out you got to live it and breathe it what are the marginal costs what are the marginal benefits if the benefits exceed the cost at the margin do it if not don't oops wrong clicker no i broke it okay so here's our marginal analysis. And I would want to add on to this uh, uncertainty. Uh, we're going to talk about that down the road um, more in the insurance chapter. So we'll add on to this. But it's OK to think about it now. Uh, we don't always know what the benefits of that advertising is going to be, right? We make it a, a prediction. Maybe the salesperson that's trying to sell us the advertising has shown us the average statistics. And I used to beat up on the yellow page people all the time when they come in and try to pitch me to get that. And, uh, uh, what are the costs associated with it? You might not know, understand all the costs associated with it, right? So they say, well, you're just going to pay us $50 a day. But they don't tell you that you're going to have to have a staff person to update the Facebook page you know, uh, every week to stay current with Facebook. Well, there's a cost associated with that, right? If they're spending office time updating Facebook, posting pictures, responding to comments, blah, 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 there's a cost associated with that. What is that cost? I don't know. It depends on how much traffic we get to the website. So when you make the decision of whether you should do the social media advertising, you don't know all the costs. You don't know all the benefits. You have to form an expectation. We want that expectation to be rational, that you've thought about all the de details as much as you can. 
And if the expected revenue is greater than the expected cost, then do it. If it's greater than or equal to, um, if not, don't do it. Every time. It sounds so simple, but it's tough when you start getting into real problems. Okay, questions or comments there? Okay, let's do this one and then we'll take a break. So how much advertising? A $500,000 increase in the TV ad budget brings in 1,000 new customers. Estimated marginal cost of TV advertising is 50 bucks. The cost to get one more customer How does revenue fit into the decision? What do you think? <clears throat> Skyler? Okay, it'd have to be more than 50,000 total or $50 per unit. Okay, so if we get, uh, we have to probably go with a gut feeling, maybe we've looked at some research, some data, maybe ran a regression on sales and advertising, and again, the salesperson is giving you some information and you've gathered other things. But you start thinking to yourself, how many more customers am I going to get? You would be surprised how many small business owners don't think that way, right? Everybody's doing it, Everybody has a yellow page ad, that means I should do it, right? Everybody's got a Facebook ad, that means I should do it, right? Start thinking about how many bodies are actually gonna come in. They're gonna start charging me this amount per month or this amount per year, whatever it is. Just start doing a little simple math and think, okay, if this is successful, I have this particular ad, this is where it gets a little bit tough, but does this ad on top of all the other advertising I'm doing, do I really feel like this is going to bring in X amount more people? I sell my product for Y, X times Y is Z. Does Z cover the $50,000 amount, right? People don't always think that way. So, but it, but it starts to make sense once we look at it and break it down on a per unit basis, what the additional costs are. We didn't put in the cost of our rent the salaries of our employees we you know we didn't put in that overhead we just looked at the cost of the ad started to think backwards to how much more dollars will that maneuver bring into my company i don't have a crystal ball you're gonna have to go with your gut eventually but at least you've thoughtfully went through it this way because you'd be surprised sometimes the answer to that might be and i'm not kidding one bit this ad would have to generate a thousand more people this week. I normally do 50 people through the door. There's no freaking way I'm gonna get a thousand people through the door. I mean, there's kind of like, duh, no brainer type decisions that go on like that. Do this calculation, kind of confirm to yourself. Again, there's gonna be a gray area. Okay, well, is it maybe that there's enough or whatever? You're not gonna be able to perfectly calculate it, but you might be able to rule out the there's no way in heck that I am going to be bringing in enough dollars to justify that expense, right? And that this helps you process that. Okay, does anybody have any examples of uh, decisions that come to mind like this where it might have helped in a former business or otherwise or a current business or where you saw kind of a bonehead decision maybe made by a, a manager, a husband, a wife, a child that's what i love about this this is we're, we're kind of focusing on business but this stuff applies to households whether we should have bought that toothpaste or not sometimes i'm i'm a victim of my own thinking I, every single decision in my life comes down to this thought process i am like in a prisoner behind bars because i can't my brain cannot not think this way so that's that, uh, that sometimes can be, 
sometimes can be a heavy load to carry, but I manage, manage to do it. All right. So let's take a break. Looks like a good spot to take about uh, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Stretch your legs.